Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Monday, everybody. First up, Asia Pacific competition between the United States and China continues to intensify. So let's look at the latest geopolitical posturing between the two giants from the last few days. Over the weekend, the United States and China held separate war games with partners in Southeast Asia, with each seeking to strengthen partnerships, increase regional influence, and showcase military strength. On Sunday, China dispatched fighter jets to Thailand in a joint air force exercise called Falcon Strike 2022. The same day, the United States was concluding its two weeks of war game exercises with Indonesia. Annual live fire drills, which started back in 2009. This year, the so-called Gurada Shield drills were the largest ever, with regional partners Japan, Australia, and Singapore joining for the first time. Of course, both sets of military drills come hot off the heels of unprecedented People's Liberation Army live fire exercises surrounding Taiwan, and a growing consensus that Beijing has shifted to a new status quo in its military stance and behavior towards the island. During these Taiwan drills, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, of which Thailand and Indonesia are both members, called for quote maximum restraint. End quote. More on Taiwan shortly. Indonesia is a dynamic player in Sino-American competition in the region. The powerful regional actor sports a large young population and growing middle class. Popular opinion of China is currently negative, and the two countries have territorial disputes. However, China is a big market for Indonesian businesses, and the Belt and Road Initiative has provided opportunities for Jakarta. We remember that in July, Indonesia's leader Joko Widodo made a rare trip to China to meet with General Secretary Xi Jinping. On the other hand, the U.S. has historically strong alliances in Southeast Asia, and although no formal security treaties exist between the U.S. and Indonesia, the relationship is strong. Indonesia's military commander, General Andika Perkasa, was educated in the United States and is known to be a friend to the Americans. With Dutch colonialism as well as Japanese invasion, both in living memory. Indonesia will remain cautious in its interactions with larger powers, both from the West as well as in Asia itself. Now, moving from Southeast Asia to Northeast Asia, late last week in Seoul, South Korea, a senior presidential official told reporters that decisions on the deployment of Lockheed Martin's Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, or THAAD, is a matter of South Korea's self-defense, and thus, quote. Non-negotiable. End quote. A clear pushback against Beijing. Deployment of the defensive American weapon system has been a matter of deep contention in Sino-Korean relations for years now. THAAD helps protect South Korea from North Korean projectiles, including nuclear-tipped ones. However, they also help protect U.S. bases in Northeast Asia from People's Liberation Army missiles. Beijing is also concerned, probably correctly, that THAAD's powerful radar will allow spying on its own missile systems deployed in North China. In 2017, the previous Moon administration committed that South Korea would not deploy additional THAAD units after Beijing imposed a series of painful, informal economic sanctions. Like Indonesia and so many other regional players, South Korea must find a balance between its largest market, China, and its security guarantor, the United States. Under South Korea's newly elected president Yoon Suk Yeol, Seoul looks to be rebalancing more towards the latter. The same official expressed that the administration is accelerating efforts to normalize the operation of the THAAD system deployed in southern Korea, and President Yoon himself has pledged to make the system fully operational, as well as install another unit in the Seoul area. Now, while we're still in the region, let's move a little further south along the first island chain 
to Taiwan. Yesterday, Sunday, a delegation of U.S. lawmakers, one senator and four House members, arrived in Taiwan for a two-day trip, the second delegation of its kind in less than a month, the first, of course, being the much-watched Pelosi visit. Unlike the Pelosi visit, however, Beijing's angry response to the visit was initially only rhetorical, with the Chinese embassy in Washington condemning the visit on Sunday. However, today, Monday afternoon, Beijing time, the People's Liberation Army announced a new round of military drills around Taiwan, the details of which are still to be released. A spokesperson for the White House National Security Council said that members of Congress have gone to Taiwan for decades and will continue to do so, and that such visits are well in accordance with the One China policy of the United States. Before Taiwan, the delegation, which includes the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations East Asia Pacific and International Cybersecurity Subcommittee, had visited South Korea, where they spoke with the previously mentioned President Yun. The U.S. lawmakers met with Tsai Ing-wen and other leadership this morning, local time. Okay, next up, the Chinese economy. And today, Monday, Beijing published very disappointing official data for the month of July, with most indicators coming in well under expectations. Quote, July's economic data is very alarming. End quote. We remember that analysts had been anticipating a stabilization of economic growth in the second half of this year, carried by government support measures, in order to get some growth for the year after a very bad Q2, pulled down by the devastating Shanghai lockdowns. China's GDP grew by just 2.5% in the first half of the year, running well below the full year target of around 5.5% set in March. As such, the July data is bad news for policymakers. According to the official National Bureau of Statistic numbers, retail sales only grew by 2.7% in July year-on-year, down from the 3.1% growth in June, and well below the 5% growth forecast by economists. Even industrial production, one of the bright sides of the economy, only grew by 3.8%, also missing expectations. Quote, It is hard to find a bright spot in today's data release except perhaps the slight decline in the official unemployment rate from June's 5.5% to 5.4%. Beijing has been pumping the supply side of the economy with credit, subsidies, tax rebates and spending on improved logistics, but that still hasn't done enough to overcome zero COVID policies and weak domestic demand. The People's Bank of China will continue to do what it can to boost business expansion. For example, it unexpectedly cut key policy rates today, even after having regularly expressed its concern about loosening while the Fed is tightening. This perhaps suggests just how worried the People's Bank of China is about the recent trade and economic data. End quote. As Pettis points out, national unemployment modestly improved in July. However, youth unemployment, ages 16 to 24, worsened to a high of 19.9%. Fixed asset investment, which includes infrastructure, property, machinery and equipment, and which policymakers used to stabilize growth in difficult years, rose by 5.7% in the first seven months of this year, year on year, slowing from the 6.1% increase year on year seen in the first six months of the year. These disappointing numbers come at a very bad time too, as the largest outbreak since the Shanghai lockdowns is shutting down cities in Hainan province, Xinjiang and Tibet, once again shaking already shell-shocked Chinese household and business confidence. But while the outbreaks in zero-COVID policy have indeed put strain on the economy this year, most analysts agree that it's the housing crisis which is having the largest negative impact on growth. Quote, Domestic demand softened due to COVID outbreaks in many cities and the worsening sentiment in the property market. The trouble in the property market is getting worse, as suspended construction and some projects make home buyers hesitant to purchase new homes. The government needs to take action quickly to turn around such expectation before it spills over to the rest of the economy. End quote. Others are even more pessimistic. Quote, 
China's growth in the second half of the year will be significantly hindered by its zero-COVID strategy, the downward spiral of the property markets, and a likely slowdown of export growth. Beijing's policy support could be too little, too late, and too inefficient. End quote. Hey guys, if you enjoyed today's episode of China Update, don't forget to the like button. And as always, anyone who wants to go the extra mile and help me continue making these episodes every day, help keep this channel sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. That is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Thank you for the ongoing support. I will see you all tomorrow.